report, but not just providing some uh, background information. That's about the extent. Wonderful. Um, who should go next? Amy. Um, I'll, I'll go and then, and then we'll have Heidi and then we can go to the committee members. Um, I'm Amy Nunez. I'm the director of the Office of Admissions and I'm excited about this um, joint effort. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Heidi? Yeah, thank you. um I'm Heidi. Um, I I'm with the Office of Admissions. I've uh, been here for a couple of years. I work with Lisa and um, primarily in the examination development unit and work with the edge team and the performance drafting team and to get those uh, exams underway. <laughs> Thank you. Great, thanks Heidi. Um, so we'll move on to the committee members now. Um, maybe we'll go in the order of, we'll start with Sal, then we'll do Dr. Bolton, then Alex, and then I'll go. Uh, quick introduction, sorry, I missed that first part. Uh, Sal Torres, I'm a senior director of the legal department at Equinix, the world's largest digital infrastructure company, and um, been on COAF now for, I think, two years, and happy to be part of this one. Thank you. Is that okay? Yep, that's perfect. Thanks, Sal. <laughs> Dr. Bolton? James Bolton, committee member. Glad to be here. Thanks, Dr. Bolton. Um, Alex, and then Michael, sorry, I skipped you. You can go after Alex. Sure, this is Alex. Uh, I'm a member of the CBE uh, IP trial lawyer, also co-founder of a legal analytics company. Uh, can't wait to dig into the weeds of this program. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Lissary, CBE member, um, specialized in legal artificial intelligence and other stuff. Great. And I'm Bethany. I'm a um, CBE member. I'm in private practice doing employment defense, and um, I'm really excited to be on the um, working group. Did I miss anybody for an introduction, Amy? Yes, Heather. Heather. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Um, I'm Heather Anderson. I am a media, entertainment, and technology lawyer, and I am on the COAP. Great. Welcome, Heather. All right. All right. I think that was everyone then. Okay. Um, so now we are going to move on to the call for public comment. So um, we have previously encouraged members of the public that want to make comments to submit their comments in writing. To everyone that did that, thank you. We appreciate receiving your comments and those will be considered by the working group and the committee members. Um, we will also be having um, additional public comment for anyone that wants to speak today. Um, I guess I'll ask first, is there anyone that has indicated that they want to make a public comment? And um, members of the public wishing to make a public comment can indicate that they would like to make a comment by using the raise hand function um, in the reactions uh, bubble of the Zoom meeting. And then Bethany, I think there's also a way for members calling in, but I don't think I see anyone calling in. So it should be good. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and I don't think I see any hands raised. So um, I think we would then just proceed on to the actual business of this meeting. So I'm gonna now turn it over to Amy to make some opening remarks and then I guess Dawn will go next. All right. So first of all, thank you all for being here and for volunteering on this um, important initiative. This is a unique opportunity for two reasons. Um, first uh, is the fact that the state bar has invested in various research in initiatives uh, related to the bar exam, um, all uh, in an effort to help improve the content and exam format. In 2020 alone, uh, three studies provided critical information on the bar exam. Uh, this includes the California Attorney Practice Analysis, this project, the Differential Item Functioning, and the De Department of Consumer Affairs Audit. Uh, this working group has been assigned to help eliminate potential bias on the bar exam by conducting a deeper dive into the diff analysis and diff data. 
the recommendations coming from this working group, along with the contribution uh, to be made by the Blue Ribbon Commission, will lead to strengthening our exam development and administration process. Um, the second uh, uh, feature that makes this very unique is that the this initiative brings two committees together on an important state bar goal. So one of the uh, Board of Trustees strategic plan is as follows. It states, support access to legal services for low and moderate income Californians and promote policies and programs to eliminate bias and promote an inclusive environment in the legal system and for the public it serves and to strive to achieve a statewide attorney population that reflects the rich demographics of the state's population. Both the Council on Access and Fairness and the Committee of Bar Examiners are uniquely poised to help carry out this goal as you both share uh, the values expressed in it. So on behalf of the staff, I wanna thank you for your for committing to this effort. And I also wanna welcome everybody um, to this project. Duan. Um, I, I just wanna echo um, Amy's thank you to all the, the committee members today to participating in this effort. Um, and as Amy mentioned, um, we are really excited that's a joint effort um, between not just the Office of Access Seclusion and the Office of Admissions, but, but really between um, COAF and CBE. And, and we think um, together, working together in the next few months, we'll be able to uh, be able to more effectively dive deeper um, into this issue. Um, and so really just on behalf of both COAF and, and um, the Office of Access Seclusion, we wanna thank all the members today and we look forward to really um, to getting diving really deep into this and seeing if there is any bias in, in kind of the exam development. So thank you, everyone. Awesome. Thank you guys for that. Um, so now we are going to go to Ron, I believe, who's going to review the data from the um, DIF report. Let me share my screen. You see the slides in in play mode, or yeah. you, is it displaying correctly? Yes, it's, it's yeah, I can see. Wrong. Okay, and yeah, the new Windows 10 version uh, sometimes is a little confusing. So when we first try to um, get to this issue of this differential item functioning. Um, the first question is, who do we work with? Because even among psychometricians, um, this technique to look at differential item functioning is not commonly used. So many psychometricians, uh, they don't really have the experience, but we're lucky to have this one person in Scantron at the time we were working with, and he had a lot of experience looking into the, these issues. Um, even though the technique is not commonly used, but in the exam development process, um, it, it's very common to incorporate diff into the development and follow-up evaluation process. So what we did is to identify the issue and discuss at the time, what's the proper sample size and what's the exam that we should include. Um, and first in, in this slides, I'll just give you some background about what DIF is, it's a statistical procedure to value patterns performance among groups and specifically the method, depending on the kind of a question that we, we used here is the comparison between two groups. So there's always a reference group and another focal group, uh, the term that they use to compare for exam applicants, exam takers with comparable abilities to see whether on any questions that they have different patterns of performance. And on a question by question, group by group, group comparison basis, uh, depending on the criteria that we select for flagging a 
question as indicating some diff results. Um, it depends on two things. One is the size has to be large enough. It's just, it's a, and then it has to be statistically significant. And both of these depends on the sample size and we'll get to those issues later on. But once you see some results indicating potential diff, the diff statistically itself doesn't automatically indicate the presence of bias in the survey, uh, in the exam questions. So from there, there's another step to take in order to identify the source in the different performance patterns between the comparison groups. So here, here on this slide, it shows the, the exam data that we use. It includes 20 exams from 2009 to 2019. And these are the exams we have fairly complete um, race, ethnicity, and gender information along with the other variables. And it included, since the focus is on written, written exam question, it included a 152 over the 10 year period uh, written questions, uh, including 116 essay questions and 36 performance test questions. Initially, we included all of the exam takers and, and the psychometrician after evaluating the data, um, they determined that it's best to limit the analysis to first time exam takers only because you have a better control about the noise that might come from repeat takers. So the results is a comparison of all of the first time takers. And then the variables, I mentioned it's always a two group comparison. Uh, so here you can compare among gender, race, ethnicity, in all of these, you have to identify one specific group as the reference group and all of the others in pairs as the focal group, um, as well as subject matter. And we can look at different patterns and they also looked at whether the patterns of the diff being flagged has any different um, trends uh, in terms of whether the exam was July or February. I mentioned earlier about controlling for the underlying performance ability of the exam takers here. We use MBE performance score as the control. Um, in their term, it's called the latent scale. Uh, assuming that MBE taps into the underlying latent performance ability and that's uh, what's used as a control here in, in methodologically. And the next few slides, before getting to the findings, um, I created some made up data as a way of just illustrating what's involved in diff analysis. So this first slide, uh, it's a scatter plot. Each dot represents a, the results performance results of an individual um, exam takers. On the vertical axis here, I label it as latent scale. It's actually the results from MBE performance score ranging from 1,000 to the maximum of 2,000. And on the horizontal scale is the written exam questions. So going through the diff analysis process, you have the MBE and the written exam scores laid out visually in this way, and then trying to see based on this high correlation between the two scales. And when you have two groups to compare to see whether there are different patterns in terms of the alignment between the two performance scores. So next one gives you an example of two comparison groups. The circle is the reference group. The dots is clustered along this line showing a high correlation between the latent scale and the written exam score. And for the focal group, they're also nicely aligned along the line. And this will be an indication that there's no uh, diff, uh, pot potential diff problems for this particular exam that we are examining uh, in this hypothetical situation. This one in this red square, there are quite a few of the exam 
scores for the focus uh, focal group that somehow deviated from the line um, plotted along the two performance scores. And when you have this situation, potentially it's an indication that some performance results from the focus focal group is not falling along the expected pattern uh, between the two performance scores. And depending on the number of applicants falling into this particular grid and how far away they deviate from the expected performance score, that would determine whether this particular exam question will be flagged as indication of having some diff issues. So overall, this is the process I just presented visually that's actually going on statistically to identify diff for each of the 150 or so exam questions. If you have any questions up to this point, um, please go ahead. And before I get to the next part, uh, showing the results. Quick question for you. Yes. You, you might, sorry, thanks. To, uh, you might be getting to this, but if you can, are you going to talk about the somewhat of the specifics or particulars within the questions that indicate a potential DIF, like the, a type of question or a type of response that's pertaining to a particular uh, gender or racial group? Yes, as part of the analysis, the first level of the analysis, as, as I indicated, it is between these comparison groups. For example, you compare between male and female uh, exam takers with male as the reference. And then if you see some differences between the two groups, the next st step may involve digging deeper into it to see among all of those exam questions showing some uh, diff differences between the two groups. What are the patterns in terms of the type of questions or the time frame or any other variables that, that we can look at, look at. But at this level, it's merely just looking at the statistical data that we have available. Ultimately, the source of the diff has to get into the actual exam questions. Does that answer your question? Yeah, maybe I'll get into it later. I was like, if what I guess what I was looking for was, is there an example where you can show this, this exam answer says X, Y, Z, and this exam answer says A, B, C, and that shows a diff because this, this answer was done by, let's say, a Latino student versus a white student so that we can see the actual comparative differences of the way people write. Is it the way they write or the way they think or the, or the methodology they take to answer a question? What is it that gives rise to the DIF? So, Sal, um, Ron, I could answer that. Um, but, Sal, you know, what we're trying to do today is um, set that up because you're absolutely right. It would be very helpful to get into the questions themselves to make that determination. You know, is it something about the question or the interpretation or whatever the case might be? So our goal today is to do a little bit of level setting so that we can lay out you know, what was the methodology that we employed? What is the process? What were the broad findings? And I think um, when we talk about next steps, that's one of the things that we want to incorporate is digging into the actual um, questions that were flagged, you know, by uh, areas as well. That's perfect. That's perfect. Thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Sure. So on this slides uh, for uh, um, along three variables, gender, race, ethnicity, and school type, I here just summarize the uh, high level findings where there are some questions flagged as indication of diff. So female test takers were flagged in 20% of the questions. And then the direction that difference shows up is generally in the direction of, uh, in favor of the female exam takers. In other words, where the MBE performance results are comparable, female exam takers tend to do better um, in 20% of the written questions. And also among different subject matters, it's um, in less frequent subject matters where we see this difference between female and and male exam takers, uh, for example, in trust wills and community property, rather than in other more common 
uh, topics like criminal law, constitutional law. So these are just clues as to what might be causing uh, the diff in some of these subject matters. Among race, ethnicity group, here it gets complicated because there's, you have uh, many more groups to compare. And as you have more groups, one of the consequences, the sample size ju just drop immediately. And on the face of it, African-American takers show statistics um, about some diff results in 16% and compared to the other minority groups, Asians uh, exam takers 7% and Hispanics have 5% of the exam questions showing diff. And there are different ways of comparing the results among different race and ethnicity and the second matrician in order to make sure that the results in this group by group comparison is not due to the sample size comp uh, uh, complications. He combined all of the uh, non-white groups and with a uh, larger sample size between the two white and non-white group comparison. The overall number of questions showing diff dropped to about 5%. And when we compare performance among different uh, school types um, with uh, California ABA school results as the uh, reference group, and the comparison shows significant difference, um, not only among uh, foreign JD students, that's an area where probably it's easier to guess uh, what the issues might be, for example, cultural linguistics and all of those, but also Interestingly, among California registered and um, California accredited law school students graduate, their performance also shows um, some large percentage of the questions to showing diff. So up to this point is just a statistical patterns among all of the questions where there are some indications of diff. Um, Ron, before we, yes. move on, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the sample size, um, how that plays into the um, findings too. Um, you have that noted in your, um, in that last chart, so. Sample size, this chart, this graph may be uh, helpful uh, in this hypothetical situation. Actually, the statistical procedures used to detect diff um, has the data laid out in this kind of a grid situation. So the first step in their analysis is to look at all of the performance scales and cut them into different groups. So hierarchically, for example, um, MBE scores, they group them into seven categories, I believe. And then also for written exam questions, they organize them in similar number of categories. And in the comparison, visually you can see performance along the same level will fall into a specific grid or box. And in this example where there are some deviations, the sample size has to do with how many exam results actually fall into this area where that indicates um, some diff uh, results. If the number of cases in a particular grid is showing some diff results or deviation from the norm as expected in this line, then that would determine the statistical significance. And as you can imagine, if the comparison is between a smaller minority group in reference to, to white, then it becomes more challenging to determine based on whatever patterns that you see, whether the small number of deviations actually constitutes statistical significant results. So that's behind the decision about looking at sample size as well as the degree of deviation from the norm. Thank you. So given what we 
can see in the different patterns of diff results among the three major comparison variables. It is important to note, again, going back to what I originally mentioned, the diff detection itself does not necessarily indicate presence of bias. It, it means there's something different in their performance patterns. What's causing the difference could be because of some attributes of this exam takers, or it could be because something in the questions themselves. So that process is, I think, for this working group to work through, depending on the methodology used to, to dig through that kind of a deeper level questions. And where, based on my survey of the literature, usually where you see um, the source of the bias could be attributed to multiple factors, including cognitive differences in co cognitive abilities or style of cognitive learning, linguistics and cultural differences. And typically the best way to organize this kind of a panel to review the questions in order to identify the potential source that could be attributed to the questions themselves rather than the other kinds of a factors is to, to ensure diversity of the panel re going through the review process. And that's the end of my presentation, summarizing the results. Any questions from here? Um, I, I just had one right now, I guess. And, and again, Amy, I'm not trying to advance the ball too far ahead, but I'm just curious. Um, does the state bar feels it has sufficient diversity now to address some of these issues that, that Ron's just pre presented? In other words, um, I guess what I'm trying to get an assess here is the speed at which we might have to work so that we don't adversely impact the people that are taking the bar in February and in July. If, if what we propose to do might take some time are there any short-term solutions we can find to address that last bullet point, for example, um, that might help the current or present bar takers? Well, I think one of the um, factors to consider is um, that we're looking at data over a 20, is it a 20 year, um, I keep uh, confusing it. Is it 20 years or 10 years because of the two um, exam cycle? 10 year, 20 yeah. exams. 10 year, yeah, 20 so years. over the past 10 years. And you know, when, you, when we uh, dove into that, I, I don't think that any of the diff that was identified rose to the level that uh, we think is a serious problem, right? Okay. I mean, um, I think it's not, um, uh, it's not to suggest that there isn't a differential in the performance, um, but I don't think it was statistically significant for us to uh, feel like this warranted, like a, you know, a, a kind of crisis management to a certain extent. So if anything, um, what we want is, you know, the outcome to be these guidelines, and it'll probably take some time for us to dive into these questions because I'm, I'm I'm trying to pull up the numbers right now as to what, uh, how many questions that we're talking about. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I was maybe, maybe I, you know, that was kind of a loaded question, so I apologize. Maybe let me just ask it this way, perhaps a little bit more streamlined is, is what is the diversity composition now of the, of the bar, bar exam graders, if we know it? Oh, of the graders? Yeah, like the, the, the folks that are, I mean, obviously we're talking about um, because I think Ron, if I heard you correctly, you know, part, part of what we're, 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 what we're trying to solution here is what's in the bar exam, how is the bar exam asked and, and are we taking into account these factors like linguistic or cultural differences? And then also how are the graders approaching this? I don't know. I'm not suggesting that the graders should be the ones solving the, the issues like, uh, cognitive or cultural differences, but if there's any sensitivity around the graders to understand, like, it, like if I read it, if I was a grader and I read something that somebody wrote that say, I would, in my head, I would say, I know what this means because that's the way I would say it or the way I grew up or the way my neighborhood or wherever I come from says it, I would have more sensitivity to how that person is answering the question that someone who's not from my background would have. So that's, I'm not saying that I'm just coming from the perspective of, 
what is the diversity makeup now? Period. So I, I can I can speak to that a little bit because um, last year when we were working with the Office of Admissions and um, you know the, the working group that. Uh, that you transitioned onto that I'm working with you and Heather, um, we, we did reach out to admissions for some uh, demographics data and we shared that at a COAF meeting um, and admissions was really willing to um, work with us to um, come up with kind of some outreach um, strategies to increase their, their diversity of their rating pool because it, it wasn't quite as diverse as I think we would all like it to be. Um, so I know Lisa, do you wanna to speak to that a little bit more? Because there was some demographics data that, that we did share that we, we have that somewhat at our fingertips. Not everybody um, reported on, on, on kind of their, their background, but um, to the extent that we had that um, uh, office admissions, uh, we were able to share that with, with everyone. Yeah, so, um, so there are, uh, you know, there is uh, outreach that has been um, implemented in terms of uh, trying to di uh, diversify, you know, the, the uh, opportunities at least um, to have people apply um, from more, um, you know, uh, diverse areas of the state, as well as, um, you know, uh, groups. Um, and so I, I don't remember exactly what those numbers were either <laughs> um, that we provided to, to Duan, but um, I, I did want to mention also that um, the development process of the exam is a, quite a lengthy process. So as far as any um, changes, you know, or, or um, you know, input uh, being put into, the, for example, the February bar exam, I think you were asking about, Sal, um, you know, that that we did question selection yesterday, actually. So so the questions are already selected by the committee and approved. Um, and so, um, you know, there, there is a longer term process in terms of the development. Um, and, and also to let you kind of, I, I did sort of a, a informal count last night of the number of questions um, that were indicated of some level of diff, in other words, um, had a, a bolded number um, um, in the appendices to the, the diff report. And um, there are as many as if you wanna go by the, the appendix, appendix that referenced the um, law school um, uh, differences, there were 149 uh, questions that, that out of 152 that had some level of, you know, that had a, um, a bold number um, attached to it. So. If you want to, you know, have some idea of how many questions we're talking about, that that is probably the maximum number, um, which is 149 of 152 questions. Well, and I also think um, one thing we need to highlight is um, what we, uh, in terms of the next steps of what we want to bring here um, to this uh, group is um, the uh, two separate processes. I think one is what the exam development process looks like. That is. You know, how is it that a question is um, selected, um, edited, pre-tested, um, and eventually shows up on the bar exam? Like, what steps do we take to get for that question to go through um, uh, that entire process? That's one session that we need to uh, probably highlight. And you've raised some things, Sal, that I didn't think about, and that is the grading process itself. Um, we should probably do a session dedicated to that. How does that work? Um, and everything from our recruitment to um, our now two phases of grading um, and as a next step, just to understand the process. Because again, um, you know, our, our uh, charge here is to come up with some guidelines and understanding those two uh, processes might uh, shed light on how we can do this. Because I think, um, you know, your idea about the grading, I think one thing we need to highlight is the fact that we um, are, uh, all uh, demographic information or any information about the applicant is stripped off um, when it goes to a grader. So, um, you know, people are really uh, blind about the person's background, what school, uh, race, ethnicity, gender, um, that is not information that we share with our graders. Um, but, you know, you've highlighted other points um, related to that, that um, and we could talk about um, you know, uh, what, uh, you know, for example, it, we try to achieve in our calibration sessions, it's part of the grading process. So, uh, you know, when we talk about next steps, I think those might be um, really good ideas that you've raised that we can uh, throw into the um, list of potential options to explore. Super, thank you. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay, 
Um, that was also, we're gonna move on to the next agenda item, which is um, 3A. So um, we're open for discussion. So uh, Amy, who was gonna go over um, this part, review of the working group charge? Um, I just wanted to highlight, um, I, I could take this next part. I wanted to highlight you know, what this group is charged with and um, do what um, Sal has already started for us. And that is explore all our options, what tools this team um, would need in order to start diving into um, a, you know, the drafting of a potential guideline. So I think it's important first to note what uh, this group has been charged with. And so um, when I, I went back to the agenda item that the board uh, directed us, um, uh, where the board directed us, and what they st stated was to better understand the results of DIF and to proactively monitor for DIF in the future, that we convene a panel that's charged with reviewing the questions that are flagged for DIF in the 2020 differential item functioning analysis, and then to develop guidelines for minimizing the risk of future differential item functioning. And so there are various options um, that we could put forth. Maybe we could create a list of um, what those might include. One of them is um, obviously something that Sal's raised, that is diving into the actual questions themselves. So bringing those questions that have been flagged, we'll figure out how to organize them, but um, bringing those questions to this uh, group to review. I think the other thing is, um, uh, something that uh, Sal has highlighted and uh, we, I've already mentioned, and that is reviewing the process itself. And, and uh, the first I was considering the exam development, but perhaps exam, de exam development as well as the exam uh, grading process. Um, and then uh, another thought has been, um, we talked about this internally, is bringing back uh, a researcher to address some of these questions. You know, uh, some of the questions that, uh, that a researcher could help us address is, um, you know, what is a standard, uh, you know, diff statistic? Like what, how do we deem what is statistic statistically significant versus what is the norm in terms of uh, performance differences? Um, or any other kinds of questions around the data itself? Because at this point, everybody has a copy of the report. Um, but anyway, so I'm just throwing this out. Um, I've described what our charge is and what our various options. So I'm opening it up for discussion in the event that anybody has other suggestions, thoughts, or would like to make a motion that we move in a certain direction. So um, no pressure, but we're here to answer and to come up with these ideas. Um, quick, quick question. And just following up on what you just said, Amy, the, in the in the report we had that you attached to the uh, to the invitation, there was the, the 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 diff analysis, and there was a big report. Is is one of the charges include or or what? Maybe it it helps to define what's not within our remit. So one of the things that was recommended to the state bar was um, whether or not uh, this the the bar exam uh, or whether or not we should California should adopt the UBE um, and and be part of that. And if we do adopt the UBE. Is there a supplemental part to the UBE exam that we make California applicants take? Is that within the remit of what this committee is charged to do as well? Um, no, that is um, a charge that the Blue Ribbon Commission is going to be working on. Okay. So um, that's a distinction there. And I talked okay. a little bit about how some of us, we, we might overlap. And we might yeah. overlap in the sense that this, oh my gosh, I can't believe my home phone's ringing. Uh, <laughs> and it's, um, I, I don't know how to hang this up. This, sorry, and it's now on video. Um, so it, that is a Blue Ribbon Commission charge. Okay. Uh, and so. <laughs> Bravo that you still have a home phone. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. So the idea, though, is that um, the overlap might exist in the sense that we're going to be studying, you know, diff at the same time that the cap, the uh, Blue Ribbon Commission is looking at the Kappa data. Um, so that that's where the uh, there might be a little bit of overlap. But our charge is really about um, uh, diff addressing the diff um, or attempting to reduce the potential for diff in future exams. But you're right, okay. we're not working in a vacuum. That's, you know, that's perfect. Of the fact that those yeah, I, come down. I just wanted to get clarification on, on just what's in the remit. I guess the, the only other 
uh, I question that I had or a comment was, um, um, I don't, this, this committee in terms of studying the DIP, is it, is it able to address the issues um, that might be or may not be in the uh, multiple, the, uh, what is it called, the MBEs? Mm -hmm. Or is that a separate part of, of our remit? The multi-state part. Yeah, the multi-state yeah. part, we um, do not oversee that. You know, um, okay. it is, um, that the National Conference of Bar Examiners um, uh, develop are the developers of that exam. Um, and okay. yeah, and, and you know, because of its format, um, that's what we use to uh, standardize um, our exams. Okay, perfect, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other um, questions or thoughts? So uh, this is Bethany, just kind of piggybacking off Sal's comments. I do think that it would be really useful for us to get into the questions like he had referenced before, um, but also one of Ron's slides had um, a reference to like some reasons that there is diff, right? Like, um, so I think maybe if we had a discussion about, you know, what exactly is causing this or, or, or it's, it's probably a question specific inquiry, I would imagine, but just a little bit more explanation. I think that'll help us really for trying to come up with some kind of end result if we know like what is the cause of this and that might be different per gender and per for gender and, and ethnicity or something like that, but that might be useful for us to evaluate also. Okay. Yes, great, thank Yeah, and I guess what you know, and dovetailing off Bethany, who's dovetailing off me, I guess you know, and the reason why I asked that of Ron before was that I guess to get a better, a, a real clear perspective of how this, how the study worked in terms of if you can, if you have a microscope and look down to it, because I know you're looking at statistically, you're looking at all these things across, you do these flow chart, uh, these charts and and graphs, but if if you had say a question that you said, okay, this question, question A, whatever that question is, the, the, what is, is the diff based on the way the question's asked or it's answered? So if the question was answered in a certain way and that's where the diff, diff results came from, what were the answers side by side that shows the white applicant versus the Latino one or the black one or the Asian one, right? And then also it would be nice, at least for me, at least I'd like to see what would happen or what would it mean to the question, not just the answers, but to the question. Could the question be asked in a different way where you might eradicate the diff by the way you ask it? So, and in that case, what would the question, the same one have to look like in order to eradicate that? I think that'd be a nice four square look at how to get rid of this problem or issue. I think the process involved in the first step, looking at the statistical data as a way of identifying diff, and the next step in looking at the questions to potentially identify the source of the diff flagging, analytically are entirely separate because the first part, looking at the diff based on performance scores, the scores really doesn't tell you all the questions that you ask about the two different exam takers, how they look at the question, how they understand the question, and how they respond to different cues in the question and to have different answers, and then different answers are graded to have different results. So in a sense, the first part in looking at the scores to identify diff is statistically precise and rigorous, but in terms of the content, it doesn't touch on the content at all. So in terms of the process of, if the goal is to improve potential bias in the question or in the exam process as a whole, this only gives you some indication about where to start. The result of the diff study doesn't give you that much concrete guidance about how to take the next step. And even less, when you see something about the results that might indicate as contributing to the diff, whether you can actually be confident about your analysis in that second step 
is also uh, not connected to the first part in uh, running a statistical diff analysis. And, I, and I'm wondering, Ron, um, you know, in terms of if the potential of looking at the an looking at applicant answers, um, I think we're talking about thousands and thousands of answers, right? And and I well, that's another distinction, important yeah. distinction, because diff is looking at large patterns involve involving a lot of applicants. And then when you look at individual answers, uh, that's an entirely different exercise. Well, then I have a question because if what we're doing is reviewing the statistical analysis and our charge is to find ways to prevent diff in the future, what is the connection then? You know, like if what you're saying is that the statistical part is totally different from the actual questions and the answers, what are we here then like, what is our end result going to be if they're not connected, you know, because yesterday we just met to pick the questions for the upcoming bar exam. And in my mind, I'm thinking if we're able to evaluate and identify ways to know what trends in diff have occurred in the past, when we're revising the questions before they're when, during the selection process, then we can be as the committee be mindful of that. But it seems like what you're saying is that there might not be a real direct connection between the two, Ron. No direct, but certainly indirect. Indirect in the sense that statistically it gives you some sense about where you might start looking at. For example, if the result shows there is no difference between female and male exam takers, then when you evaluate the different performance, you don't wanna pull results from these two different groups as a comparison. And for example, another example, if where the largest difference, either in terms of size or the number of exam questions that you see diff is between ABA and non-ABA law school graduates, then it gives you some clues as to what might have caused the difference in their performance patterns. Um, give you an example of one application of diff analysis in the medical field where they use an assessment tool for pediatricians. They use the assessment tool to evaluate the illness of involving children. And after they get the assessment results between uh, among many pediatricians, and they look at the different results between female and male doctors, and they found out among female doctors they have a higher tendency of identifying the underlying illness of children. So that gives them some clues about what to do next. So they conducted a lot of interviews and they found out the difference lies in female doctors' ability based on their experience of just talking to children and the ability to get the critical information from children. So the same assessment tool used by female and male doctors have different results as a reflection of their different experience interacting with children. So that's the kind of a follow-up, maybe more qualitative in-depth analysis to go through the questions in order to identify the root cause of the potential diff performance. But, um, sorry, but I think it goes back, it still relates to this um, thought of simply getting the question that has been flagged may still require more information beyond that. You know, it's just all everyone's gonna have is what was asked, not, um, you know, what these outliers are. Those people who, you know, the um, difference with a high performing response and a low performing response like because I think you're trying to figure out what the concept what what was a concept that was lost or misinterpreted uh, whatever the case might be that um, each you know when you're examining the question itself that you still might need uh, more than just the question you're going to need to know um, what some of the outliers were in either direction as a high performing or low performing to see what that differential is. Right. I mean, is, is that what everybody Yeah, saying? it's a combination of how the questions are phrased, reflecting different backgrounds of the students or exam takers in terms of their cultural linguistic background. And another example, when we were talking about 
getting to the next stage, the psychometrician doing the study, he gave it an example when he was teaching, he spent a lot of years as a teacher. He said in some of the schools, whenever he used the term magnitude, the students have a little difficulty understanding it. But when he used the term size, none of them have any difficulty. So it depends on the wording or certain questions. Another example is what I personally heard from a bar exam taker. She did poorly on a real property exam. And the real property question asked the question about using the word cul-de-sac. She grew up, she said she grew up in a neighborhood. She never learned this word. And that key word in the question um, really just uh, tripped, him, tripped her not being able to get to the key issue uh, involved in the question. Yeah. So the source that could contribute to the diff performance among different groups, depending on the particular nature of the issue, whether it's cultural linguistics and the experience and the background of the student. It's a combination of both of them together and necessarily involving a large percentage of the interaction between these two factors. So how do we get to that? Uh, I think it's a process that requires um, a little thought, um, maybe benefiting from guidance who have gone through a similar process. I think some of the psychometricians, they might have experience uh, facilitating this kind of a exercise. See, that, that helps a lot, Ron, what you just said, because that, that's precisely what I was interested about was, you know, certain words, I mean, it, it would be very arrogant for us to assume that just because a student's finished law school, they have educated themselves comprehensively and exhaustively about the English language to the degree where they can handle any word. I mean, that nuance right there, the word cul-de-sac, um, you know, I grew up in a neighborhood where there were no cul-de-sacs and we didn't call them cul-de-sacs. You know, they were called dead ends and we had a Spanish word for that, right? <laughs> Don't go down that street. That was what it's called. So I really didn't learn about cul-de-sacs until my last year in college. And you know, this, those kind of nuances come late in some people's lives and in their life experiences. So. That's very helpful, Ron, and, and it kind of begs the question, if what you're saying is that, and I don't want to misconstrue what you're saying, so help me understand this, because it sounded like what you were answering to Bethany that, well, the question is one thing, the answer is another thing, and they're not connected. How are they not connected if the very word that this student didn't understand led to her inability to answer it correctly? How is that not a connection? Then? So, so. Yeah, how is that not a connection? I think the connection is there. If you ask me how to establish the connection, I'm only thinking of establishing statistical connection. That's the difficult part. Okay. So maybe that's the remit there is like, like we got to get Ron and, and his intellect to help us figure out what are all the connective tissues between the stats? Because, you know, I took stats in college, but don't ask me to interpret your, your great stuff. Um, but, you know, for the members of the public or anyone who reads something is what is the connection colloquially that you make between the statistics and the question and the people who, who answer those questions? So maybe that's one thing we can do is maybe um, one of the deliverables might be is, is how do you make the connection between the statistics and the question and the bar taker, right? What is the process? If there is one, what is it? If there is one, why isn't there one? And how do you find one? Maybe that's one of the charges we can have as an idea. And just to piggyback back off, off of that, I think, um, you know, as staff, we, we had met um, the last few, Amy and Ron, I, I think we were going to um, engage with some, um, I'm going to get this wrong, but maybe a perhaps Scantron or some, like, to give us some direction and how do we, when we take a look at the, the questions, give us some, train us and, you know, what to look for, right? Is that, can we right. speak a little bit to that? We reach out to them, um, trying to get some sense about what kind of a facilitation or consulting support that they might have. Um, We're still in discussion because the psychometrician who conducted the study um, at the time with the Scantron is no longer with them. So we'll have to talk to them more about the, uh, some appropriate consultant that we, if we're interested to work with them. 
Well, uh, what I'm wondering is um, maybe if we can, um, maybe as an um, interim step, you know, we, I think bringing somebody in is a, is a great idea, but maybe um, our initial task should be to start by diving into some of these questions because maybe um, it's a little um, easier on, on the face of it once we look at these questions um, to start coming up with this list of like, you know, whether it's a, a cultural um, or linguistic, uh, in, or which are both, right? Um, issue that we need to come up with. Um, or, you know, by in that initial review, we could identify that we would like to see, you know, um, variant answers and that we also need a researcher to kind of help us interpret um, how to proceed with some of this. Um, I'm just suggesting that as an initial step because I know we keep speaking in the abstract and until we start this task, we, it, you know, this, um, yeah, it, it'll, uh, we, uh, we'll have a more realistic sense of what's doable. And Ron, um, I have a follow-up question. Is there a way to organize the questions by those that had the highest uh, rates of, um, I don't know if there's a, like a, a numeric value to the, um, to the dif uh, performance difference um, between uh, the two groups. Um, but is there a way to uh, identify those that um, had the, the greater variance in, in performance? I have to look at the data. I think it's part of the re report. He sent us uh, supplemental information about the diff indicators in the two dimensions, statistical significance and size attached to each question related to each pair of the comparisons. So that would involve a second level analysis of the diff results to identify, if I understood you correctly, some patterns among all of the questions where there are some diff results, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not only at the individual question level, it also involves questions relative to the comparison groups that show some diff results because the same question, it might have nothing about diff results when you compare a group A and B, but then in some other comparisons, it might just jump out with a very large diff. Mm -hmm. So that's an entirely different set of analysis, almost like uh, presenting more detailed information behind the summary results that I um, presented in, 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 in those few slides. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, but then in the absence of that, um, we'll just get the whole um, a list of the results. The entire list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, entire list. Okay. All right. I mean, that sounds like a, a, the, the best strategy that we could use at the moment. Okay. All right. Any um, other ideas or thoughts, concerns <laughs> about this, about the next steps? Okay, what, um, I, you know, I, I'm gonna um, uh, move on to another part of next steps. Um, we did not, have not done this and um, we could do it now or we could do it at a later time, but we need to identify a chair and possibly a, a vice chair for, for this working group that will help um, Bethany um, graciously volunteered to do this one, but um, for future ones, and I'm not sure if we want to do this now or if you guys want to just send an email if anybody's interested in doing either one of those and then we can move on with that. But um, we do need that as, um, you know, uh, ins to ensure that we're bag leaking compliant, but just to help facilitate our meetings as well. So if anyone is interested in serving as the chair or vice chair of this working group, if you could let us know that would be very helpful. And Heidi could, uh, all of that could go to Heidi, who's our coordinator for this working group. Yeah. And we thought perhaps, um, you know, if, if, if there's interest perhaps um, with the chair position, having um, somebody from COAF as well as um, to help with Bethany. Um, 
but obviously depending on your availability and your interests. So no pressure. Okay, that's just a, a minor housekeeping item. All right, so then um, do we have any ideas or anything that we want to um, attempt to put on our next agenda? One of the uh, dates that we looked at, because um, we're trying to coordinate between when our next CBE meeting is, as well as when our next COAP meeting um, occurs, and um, given that we're going into the new year, I think our group has identified the second week of February as a potential next meeting date. And so the question that I have for everyone here is, um, what should we prepare for this group um, for that next meeting date? Um, does anybody have any thoughts around that to help advance um, you know, this directive? Would it be feasible to get the diff flagged questions by the time of the next meeting? Yep, my question, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. Lisa, uh, you think we yeah. could do that? So um, we have a certain number of years that are already posted online. So those are electronic um, and I'm, it may be that all of them are, um, but to the extent that they are not electronic, uh, then we need to, we do have, you know, paper copies. But I think that probably most of the questions, if we're talking about 10 years, are probably um, available electronically. So uh, I, I would assume maybe instead of paper copies that the, um, the working group would want maybe USB or something with the electronic copies because printing out paper copies would take a significant amount of time. Yeah. Um, and given our uh, meeting format, uh, we should probably, electronic seems like, yeah, the most appropriate. Okay. So then we'll um, supply electronic formats of the diff um, flagged uh, questions to the committee by the next meeting. Uh, to the I, I think, um, just, just to be clear, um, are, am I supposed to provide all, I mean, given that my count was that for the, um, the greatest number uh, on any of the appendices was 149 out of 152, do you want all 152 or do you just want the 149? Because the 149 encompasses all of the appendices. So all of the, um, you know, different uh, diff analyses. So Elisa, just to be clear, you're, you're saying that um, 152 uh, questions were flagged all together. No, 149 out of 152, because 152 questions were the total number that were included in in the diff so 149 uh were were flagged in of with some level of diff in other words with what you know with some bolded number um and uh in the appendix the i think it was the third or fourth appendix the law school one so that was would have been the all-encompassing one so so those questions 149 would it include you know all the other questions would include the same questions that were some, you know, flagged somehow in the other um, appendices, which had to do with gender. Is there, is there, is there like a, are there ones that are more flagged? I, I know that's probably not the proper um, terminology. <laughs> so, so there are ones with higher numbers than others, but again, some had multiple numbers, you know, multiple. And then there's the, you know, the two methods by which the statistical, so Ron maybe can help me with that. There was the LORS and then there was the other, so there were, you know, two methods by which there was flagging going on. Um, so yeah, there were some that had higher than others, but you know, again, I, uh, I don't wouldn't know, you know, what number we're talking about, and then. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, sorry, sorry, Ron, go ahead, go ahead, Ron. I was going to suggest to Lisa that we can probably get together to look at the list of all of those questions flagged and try to identify patterns in all of those questions and select a few uh, that has the highest indication um, based on whatever measure, so that as an initial step, you will have those questions that's easiest to see the potential problem, rather than have a long list of all of the questions, because this exercise, moving from flag indications statistically to actually the questions, the wording, all of that, as I said, is not an easy step. So it might be beneficial to select a few that we think statistically at least they have a higher indication of, of diff rather than 
being comprehensive and complete. Yeah, I would, yeah, Ron, I was just going to say that I, I don't I don't know. I mean, I, I'm just speaking for myself, but I don't know that we'd want it to see 149 questions, uh, maybe more like the top 10 right, questions right. that you decide. Hey, if you look at these top 10, here's where the chart just went off the chart, right? The chart went off the chart. You know what I mean, right? This is where the skew is really high. Um, and I think maybe as item number two for, for the questions to make sense. And I'm taking a page out of Ron's comment before, which was, and I think you said it best, Ron, I think it was like to, to, to have you explain how you made the connections or how the, how the diff was created, something to that effect, where I said, you know, what's the connection? You said, you didn't ask me how they got connected. It's the how. So I think we know what the what is. We know there's a, what is, there's a diff. Um, we know where it is. We know it's with these groups, with these genders, et cetera. But the how is what we, I think, could use a little bit more knowledge base on. So if you could do that at the, at the meeting in February, saying, now that we have these tens, let's take one of these tens and here's how we establish, here's how you see it, here's what makes this so prominent that it created this dip. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, I, I do just want to express, express one concern is that, um, as Ron's mentioned, we just need to make sure we have our um, researcher on board who will help us make that connection and you know, especially somebody with that experience so I think identifying these 10 you know 10 to 15 questions and um, I think that should be the priority and, and then also the second priority is bringing somebody on board to help us um, make that interpretation can I ask one more, have one more request or question? Because it's my understanding that the written questions evaluated were the essays and the performance test, right? So, um, and I, because there's more essay questions, if we're going to do the top ones, I feel like most of them may just all be essay questions. I just want to make sure that we're able to evaluate the PT as well as the essay, because those are both, you know, components of the bar exam. Well, the PT was flagged as um, also, I mean, okay. I just as many, I don't want to say just as many times, but you know, th there was no, I didn't see any patterns like, you know, PT was left off the list, so. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I'm looking at, at, of the 152 questions, 116 were essay and 36 are PTs. So they were included. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So um, let me just summarize uh, where we're at. It looks like, um, uh, I wanna make sure also that uh, the second week in February is doable for everyone. Um, so if you could let us know, that's what we're aiming for. And um, Heidi will uh, collect all of that information. And um, then as a next step, the idea is to get, um, uh, Lisa and Ron will work together to identify the more, more like uh, uh, the 10, uh, 10 to 15, uh, questions in electronic format will, that will be a combination of essay questions and PT that have more of the stark uh, differences in, um, and you guys will have to figure out how to evaluate that um, for the February meeting, and as well as potentially bringing in um, somebody to help us interpret um, those differences at the meeting. Does that sound feasible? All right. Is there yeah. a all right, and then along with that, I talked about the fact that we also want to look at um, processes. We don't have to do it all at the same meeting. I mean, our next meeting could be dedicated to the questions themselves, and perhaps at a later meeting, at a future meeting, can talk about the uh, grading and exam development processes. Um, does that sound uh, like a good plan? Sounds good to me. So for the February meeting, talk about the yeah. grading process. Um, at, or at a future meeting. So that February will be dedicated to the essay, the questions and digging into the questions. Um, and, and, you know, that might be one of the times there, we might go come to that February meeting and find out we need to look, you know, do a deeper dive of the questions. But the idea then is after the February meeting of the following one, when we make that determination when that is, that that one is dedicated to looking at, um, so that would be our third meeting, to looking at the processes of both exam development and grading. Yeah, that sounds okay. right, yeah. All right. Any other thoughts? Uh, one of the agenda items that we put on here is um, Office of Admissions uh, updates and I just, uh, or developments. 
And um, this was um, in response to the idea that <clears throat> when we scheduled this meeting, if we had any updates about activities that were happening in uh, the state bar, that we would report them. But we just had a CBE meeting not that long ago, like uh, about two weeks ago. So we don't have any updates. And um, I think Dwan and Elizabeth, you guys checked in and you recently had a COAC meeting as well, right? So, so we had a COAC meeting earlier and we don't have any um, substantive updates either, but um, we had thought that we leave that agenda item as a standing agenda item for both CBE and COAC in case there are for future meetings. Yes. All right. Okay, so, um, I think that is all of our meeting business for today. Unless anyone has anything else they wanna discuss, I will pause so you can say so. Okay, um, I think that this meeting is adjourned then. So we will see you all at the date that is selected in the second week of February. And thank you all so much for your time this morning. Thank you, happy, happy holidays. holidays. Happy holidays. Have a Merry Christmas. All right. Bye everyone.